Turn to Genesis 4, if you would. Genesis 4. We'll read that, Genesis 4, verse 3. And in a process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. He was very angry. And his countenance fell. Cain was upset. Why was God not pleased? What happened there? Why did, uh, why did not uh, God have respect for, uh, for Cain's offering? What was wrong? What was wrong with Cain's offering? There must have been something wrong with it. Uh, what is an offering? Think about these things. Is God unreasonable? Why did God even mention that Cain was a tiller of the field? Uh, why did he mention what these two men did for a living. Now, God is not an unreasonable God. We understand that. He starts us with whatever we are. And then he works with that. So keep that in mind. My title is Cain and Abel. What was the problem? Cain and Abel. What was the problem? Uh, three, uh, I'll mention three points here. It's not all that important that they're divided into points, but I divided them up so we can kind of keep things straight. Number one, not much is described about this offering. When you look at Genesis 4 uh, in that area there, 3 to 5, uh, there's not much described about that offering and what led up to it. It's, it's, it's a short account. Each brother had a source from which to draw on for a sacrificial offering. Uh, they both worked. Uh, but what did they sacrifice? They sacrificed what they had, what was theirs. Uh, just like we sacrifice. We sacrifice what belongs to us or what we've worked for. We don't sacrifice from something that we don't have or that belongs to someone else. Cain's property to be sacrificed was, as described here, of the fruit of the ground. That was Cain's property. That was what he did for a living. That's what he sacrificed, something produced from the fruit of the ground. Did God expect Cain to go out and access an animal from which to constitute his sacrificial offering? We've, we, we've heard about these things through the years. Maybe God expected that. Maybe he didn't. And number three, was Cain's sacrifice not his best? Now, there's something there. Maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't. Maybe that was the problem. Maybe it wasn't Cain's best. Did Cain understand? Uh, from what we understand from tradition, uh, uh, Cain wasn't a teenager there. These, these, these weren't teenage boys. Uh, you know, he was maybe 35 years old, maybe 75 years old, we don't know. But they were, uh, they were mature men. Now, through the years, we've gotten instruction concerning this account. We've all heard sermons and sermonettes regarding Cain and Abel. And some have stressed that Cain's offering wasn't an animal. It wasn't blood, and, and, and blood was not shed. And, and maybe that was the problem. Um, maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. That may be true. I don't know. Although there is an offering listed in Leviticus that has nothing to do with either blood. That's the, the, the meal offering. But maybe this was an offering that didn't fall in that category. You know, maybe those offerings at that time weren't divided up that way. There's a whole lot in this account that's not said. There's just a whole lot that's not described. So what was the problem? What was the problem? Maybe not anything that's been mentioned so far or that we even see mentioned in the account. Maybe we're looking at something else in this problem with Cain and Abel. As an example, maybe 
It was an attitude problem. We may be dealing with an attitude problem. That may have been what they were dealing with, something from the inside. And if that's so, whose fault would that have been? Cain's fault, maybe. Adam and Eve's fault, maybe, probably, who knows. Uh, there may have been a child rearing issue. Uh, like I said, these weren't infants or teenagers. These were mature men, but they grew up and uh, they had been reared. And so there may have been a problem there from early in their life. Uh, we can only look at the possibilities of all these things. Uh, but to find a possible real conclusion, let's look at the uh, conversation between God and Cain. Let's just look at that. This was a conversation after the fact. It that there may have been some, some competition going on here. Uh, competition is rampant in the human, in the human uh, uh, way of looking things. Uh, it appears that there may have been some competition going on here. Who had instructed Cain and Abel to make these offerings? Or, or did they do it on their own? Um, according to their godly family training, they may have been raised up, reared to say, well, you know, you've got to offer something to the Creator, you know. Uh, maybe that was the way they were raised, I don't know. Uh, was it as a result of some instructional training from their parents, as I mentioned there? How else would they have heard about God? Obviously, there's a lot more going on here than what is simply written down. There's just a lot going on here. The fact remains that the problem was what was the intent? What was going on in the heart? The offering submitted by Abel was apparently from the heart. And it's obvious that he had a right and proper intent. Not much is said about Abel's offering except it was accepted. Whatever his training was, whether from his parents or directly from God, it was accepted and put in a proper uh, practice with no competitive motivation. Just an honest gift to God. But what was going on in Cain's mind may not, or, or, or it may have been something else than just an honest gift to his creator. His offering may have been something other than just an honest gift. There must have been a history of jealousy and competition between these two men that Cain thought could be settled by whatever he thought was the better offering. His offering, my offering's better. Look at my offering. It must have come as quite a surprise to find out that God was not pleased. Probably, Cain dressed his offering up as a glittering gift to his creator. And it was really a surprise to him that his creator wasn't pleased with all the effort he had put into it. Not because it wasn't beautiful and wonderful, but because it came from the wrong direction. It was something put on. God gives us the solution as he gave it to Cain. These things can be fixed. When we're found out, these things can be fixed. When we see these things, when God shows these things to us personally, they can be fixed. It's how do we react to them. Whatever you do, do it from a pure and honest heart with no strings attached. Don't worry about what's gone before, what happened yesterday or what happened last week or last year. Just repent before God. Pick up and go again. Genesis 4, then in verse 6. Let's read that while we're there. Genesis 4, verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? Uh, God had corrected Cain. Verse 7. If you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at your door. And unto you shall be its desire, sin's desire. And your responsibility is that you shall rule over it, over sin. Your responsibility is that you should 
rule over sin. Your instruction here is to rule over sin. Now, I speculated earlier in this question regarding Cain and Abel. What was the problem? Whose fault was it that such a terrible and horrible sin as killing was committed? Whose fault? We may not uh, know for sure, but we can start with what happened and funnel that down to one cause. Certainly the end result was Cain's sin, but it began, and the overall reason that it happened, we'll see that Satan was the initial cause of what happened. Uh, we see in another place, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, because we're all familiar with that. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child, that's the instruction, in the way when he is old, he will not depart from it. That doesn't mean our children will follow God's way continually through the years, but, but through the years, in many cases, our children remember how they were reared, and they remember the good things, and they remember the proper things, and they remember the godly things, and in many cases, they come back to serving God. The parents, Adam and Eve, and we're all familiar with that, they'd already rejected God. They'd reje rejected God's direction, and they'd been already removed from his presence. They'd already been removed. They had already, in a sense, disqualified themselves. And when they did that, when they were uh, removed from the Garden of Eden, that left the door wide open for Satan's influence on everything that, that, that was left because they did things the way they thought they should be done, not the way God had instructed them, including their child, child rearing. When you add all this together, the accumulation adds up to Satan's rule in the lives of the first family. I'm not talking about the president. I'm talking about the first family. As we now approach the Feast of Pentecost, now, tomorrow, this has to be a warning to all of us. The original New Testament Day of Pentecost highlights a tremendous change in what would become Christianity. Actually, Christianity was given birth on the Day of Pentecost. God gave the whole spirit of change to all who would accept his calling and introduce that on the day of Pentecost. The whole message of the gospel is change, and it began there that day. Sometimes we can attempt to change on our own, as Cain tried to do, and we've all done that. But if you examine the results of that, we always fail when we do it from that point of view. We've all failed in our intentions and motivations to do things on our own. Anytime we try to do things on our own, we fail. That's why we pray for God to, another scripture says, create in me a clean heart. Create in us a clean heart. That's the only way we'll be able to change. That's one of the things the day of Pentecost must represent to us. Something that's brand new. The day of Pentecost represents to us something that's brand new. We must be reminded to do that daily, not just on the day of Pentecost. Pray for God to create in us a new heart, not only on the day of Pentecost, but each day of our lives. And we have to do that daily. We must do that daily for it to work. Just to wrap it all up, three points, very simple. Number one, keep your mind clean and your attitude right from the inside out from the inside out. Number two, renew your sense of Pentecost each day, each day of the year. Draw on the Holy Spirit of God continually. And number three, seek the unity of God the Father and Christ in your daily activities and your association with all other human beings.